Okay, we're ready to get down to the shop. We're ready to get to work on this. Two fuselage. I feel like I'm making a P82, F82. Two fuselages. Now this is where we left our pride and joy on the last. Uh, the last. He's sitting here with the glue cooking on the carbon fuselage, and with the paint cooking on the wooden fuselage and parts. And we're going to be bouncing back and forth while working on one. The paint or the glue or the epoxy will be drying on the other one. Well, if it's Saturday, it must be grouting day. How's Miss Grouting doing? <laughs> the professional grouter. Now look, you could use Aero Epoxy Light to grout this, you know. You need more grout? I do. Anyway, the master plumber here. He's looking forward to putting his faucet in, finishing the tile work, putting his drip tubes in. Oh, we need a break from all this model aviation, all this fun model plane work. Look at those nice matching antique faucets. Ooh, probably made it a carbon fiber. We haven't picked out the wallpaper yet, but you can bet Karen, in fact, we spent the whole night. I could have built a plane in the time we spent looking at wallpaper. Faucet next. Now, one of the tricks I learned, and it's a real good trick if you're doing your own bathroom, and Norm Abrams here, put the faucets and drain and everything in before, before you put the countertop in. Then you don't have to crawl on your knees to do it. I'm not so good at crawling at my age. That's the best tip I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. Get all the faucets and everything well before you even drop it in. I like it. Wendy's home. See, I should be in a home video business, like doing home renovations. Concourse house. Girls, well, well into the end of the third wall. Wow. One quarter of the room left. One quarter. Oh, I'm telling you. Planes is really easy <laughs> compared to this junk. A custom tin ceiling going up. We could figure a way of uh, molding that out of fiberglass or something. I'm trying to improve it. Let's see how Tile Girl is doing. Oh, and plenty of duct tape holding up the new racks while the glue dries. Very attractive. Hey, the sink is in. Bada bing, bada boom. Ah, the ceiling is going in. We wind down the end of weekend two. Check this ceiling out. Nice old-fashioned tin ceiling. Needless to say, we got a decent light fixture in for this. But anyway, little by little, it's coming together. We got the new sink in. But I'll tell you, after a weekend of working on this stuff, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Can't wait to get back to working on model planes. Back to the shop. Okay, now with that bathroom ceiling drying, we can get back to work in here. Let's make sure, and I always like to check once I get done with something like this, I want to check that I do have clearance here around the whole perimeter. What I'll do is I'll put a layer of masking tape here and then just dress this off to make sure I have as close a fit as I possibly can. I'm assuming by now this, this epoxy really dries for about three hours, but, but we have a decent joint here and I'll dress this whole joint off after I pull off the tape. You can see there's just a little bit extra material here and a little bit of glue sticking up. Now I'll get a sanding block and just dress this nose area off. Now it seems easier once I pick out the high spots to just get the, the spinner out of the way and then I put it back in just to verify I'm not taking too much off. You only have to take off about a, God, not even a 64th of an inch here. And the last little bit I like to get off with the spinner in place and use your finger for a fit. No, I put a little bit of a reinforcement on that nose ring. I didn't want that nose ring to get weak or soft. 
I'll let this dry, and when this dries, I'll work on a canopy. While it's drying, I could work on sanding that joint on the canopy. It's that joint that I want to get a nice edge on. And this is another, another area that, like on the wood fuselage, I'm going to work on a lot because I want to get a nice crisp line there in the final finish. And boy, after letting that silver dry up for three days, I'll bet when we get to sand that off, it's just going to sand like butter now. Now while I'm waiting for that glue to dry, open up the mail here. Paul Winter sent this great photo. It's nice. It's right in my shop. Nice lodge and lodgement. Only one problem, Paul. The good old British or American post office. If they broke the glass, I'll have to make up a glass for this. Anyway, this is his version of Tsunami, and I just wanted to show this for a, a quick bit. It's a take-apart plane, but the canopy, you know, I sent him a carbon fiber canopy for the next one. He's making, oh no, I think he's making voodoo, but this one really looks pretty decent. And I hope we're going to see this at Brodax and at the Nats, if he comes to the Nats. A nice a nice version of Tsunami to go with Ken Clapson's version and with my former version and I don't know it looks pretty it looks pretty nice in these colors all Brodak dope okay that seam is looking pretty good now so the way this worked out and this is it, it, I can't even tell you how rigid this is what I'm going to do is remove some of this motor mount material in here where the motor mount pad actually ends. I just think this is just going along for the ride and I'm trying to clean up this nose section. Going to have to add some thickness in here. Eh, maybe not. Really can't tell. This worked out relatively well. I like the reinforcement around the nose ring. Up here, it's, it's kind of pointless to try to save weight up here. There's just too many other easier ways to do it. with one removed and I put the motor back in trying to trying to find where the pad ends I don't want to go any further than that and then I don't want to have a stress riser I want a nice smooth transition okay that worked out well and that that got us off uh, a little more than a quarter of an ounce I cleaned this all up with M600 you can see it's still wet in there now what it's with the last thing is I just want to put the engine back in and just make sure I don't have any any place where it doesn't fit. I can always get a final little fit. Just go right up to the spinner, but not out onto it. And if I flip, I have that tape to protect it. Now the next thing I want to do is I got the alignment, this has all been laid out on a previous video, and I want to cut this piece out and start fitting in the wing. I'll be able to cut this with this cutter, in fact I may have to use the roto zip to do that, but the rest of the shell as always. I'm leaving a little bit of material on. Again, we don't need this piece, so we're just going to sacrifice it and put it in with the scrap. Here there's mounts and doublers. I don't know if we're going to be able to get through that.
as where the motor mount is. That's why we're having trouble getting through it. But with this, I know if you just go slow, bit I'll get out and I'll get in there with the Dremel tool with a drum sander and these pieces I'm gonna save these for possibly some I don't know what we'd use them for but there's certainly good material there worth saving I have a box and what I did I saved all the scraps from this whole project just for experimenting and for just seeing for instance seeing how thick that really is what I'll tell you right now with the thing that's making me sad is that I really over I overdid this by about 50%. There's no way this has to be this thick. And uh, I just really, really feel like I've, I've almost doubled what this has to weigh for, well, well, I guess we'll find out if the nose flies off the plane. Because this material trims so easily, I would say it isn't even worth trying to make a final cut. Just cut within a quarter of an inch and do the final little bit. Just grind it right into position. Okay, and obviously the next thing we can get this tape off of here. And then we need to get the wing and do a little dry fit and see how close we have this. Now, just looking at these two before I lay out the wing, because the next thing is going to be to get the formers in, and I need to get an exact, because I'm using this wing and this fuselage, what I'm going to need to do with either shim or shave from that fit to this fit. In other words, whichever one, this one is going to be the like the square one. When I put it in here, I need to get an exact alignment so that I can take that wing out and put it in here and still maintain all my angles. And after looking at this from several angles, then I'm still not sure whether we're going to have, we're probably going to have to make a whole new back piece. But anyway, it's starting to look like what I had envisioned when I started the project. The two fuselages sitting side by side. All right, I'm going to line up this wing, try to line it up. Yeah, they look like brothers, there's no doubt about it. Now, this, right from the very beginning, this whole thing was <laughs> at least in the worst of all was it was subject to change and one of the things I'm gonna make a change to right now I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to uh, to do a little experiment now here's what's here's what's really happened you see if I line this up when I line this up because I'm I definitely want to use both wings you see how different these are and I'm not sure at what point in time I I miscalculated that but what it is is if you look at this I never took into account and I'll tell you this this it's pretty embarrassing but hey but I want you to, I want to share this with you so you can see just how complex a project like this is what happened is I don't have a way of using this wing it already has this saddle on this fuselage and I thought oh you know what I'll do I'll I'll just take a saw, cut this right down the middle, and, and spread it. Now, you know what? I have another shell upstairs. And and now this is part of the whole mystique of, uh, uh, mystique, the whole idea of doing this was that I could replicate these fuselage relatively easily. So what I'm going to do, rather than, rather than try to cut this and spread it and, and make some kind of a hodgepodge there, what I'm going to basically do is go upstairs, get the other shell, 
and make another fuselage. And I'll try to minimize how much it echoes on the video, but what it allows me another step. And again, this has evolved in such a way that I'm not sure I even know what the ultimate outcome is. One of the things this is going to allow me to do, and I didn't plan it, I didn't start out this way, but it's going to allow me to do is to use this fuselage, which is narrower than the other one, to just basically make another airplane. But what I will have to do is, when I make the wing, is make the top part. Or well, the other point would be you could use it, of course, and it just wouldn't match up. Well, anybody that knows me knows I'm not going to do that. But now, if this were a wood fuselage, imagine the hours of cutting and carving and sanding it. But in our case, it's not a big deal at all. We already have the shells molded up. So what I'm going to do is go upstairs, get the shells, get the crutch, and get started on it. I just, <laughs> there's no way I can, uh, no way I can be happy knowing that I somehow didn't account for that, the thickness of the fuselage side. Now, it could be that my other shell, I'm not going to be able to spread it and maintain the, the shape I want. It's out by, a, by, it's out by two one-eighth amounts. Even though the center lines line right up, the width is wrong. But again, I'm going to start. I have the shell. I'll have to put the crutch in, make the bulkhead, make a tank former, make all of them, of course, wider to the wider dimension. But to bring it up, now see, this is a good thing. I never put any, you know, any of the highly detailed things up here. What's nice, though, now is I do have the opportunity to step back a little bit, punt, and I'll have a spare fuselage. I'm always a big believer in is when you have a problem, the thing to try to do when you make a mistake is to try to let as many other people know about it so that they don't make the same mistake. And obviously, if you're trying to make a plane with two wood fuselages, this wouldn't be a problem. But I never took that into account. And you can imagine how how far down the road we are. And you feel like, didn't he think of that? Well, you know what? I didn't. All right, let me go get the shells. Now, one time-saving might be that a lot of the things that I had to lay out on this, as an example, the fuselage doublers, a lot of the things that I really needed to spend a lot of time laying out, I already have patterns for. That's going to save me some time. I already have a shell, and by the way, this shell is four layers, this one is two layers, so I have a much lighter shell. Don't know if that's going to be a real significant thing. I have a spare crutch and I can get busy grinding this. I'm going to do most of this off camera until I bring it back up to the point except for anything I find that's a shortcut. But as an example, now I can tell exactly how long the crutch has to be. I know I can do this before I even mount it in the plane. The doublers. And I just need to make the fuselage. What's nice about these shells is you can do this or you can make them wider. They're kind of, at this point in time, they're very customizable. And I'm really, again, I really have to uh, share the share the mistake with you and hope that if you're doing something similar to this, I mean, maybe somewhere earlier on I should have checked that width. I, and I don't, I just, I don't know how to explain it. Dumb, I guess, is the right word. Anyway, all right, I'm gonna knock this off as quickly as possible. I finally resolved to my own satisfaction what I had done wrong is I had allowed for the doublers to be mounted to the side of the crutch and then inadvertently when I mounted them I wound up mounting them this way so what happened is I lost the thickness of the two doublers but it's given me a chance and I'm not I'm not as depressed as I was this morning by looking at this now I I can take into account all the material that has to be removed from the crutch. In fact, I can get rid of that whole last bar, get rid of the angles. Having a part already made up to use as a, for all purposes as a template is going to be a big advantage in trying to get this done in a hurry. Not in a hurry, but just as an example, knowing how much of that I can take off of the front. And my mother always used to say it builds character to live through these disappointments. This has become a three fuselage airplane project now. 
but I, I'm sure I'll learn and benefit from this mistake. Now, by having to make this extra fuselage, what I'm doing, and it's it's going to work to my benefit. I'm getting to do a couple more experiments that I wouldn't normally get to do till next season. One of them was I wanted to make these little plates out of layers of 64th plywood for the blind nuts to see if this was going to be a little bit better way of doing it. And, of course, the blind nuts don't really stick down into the carbon the way I would want them to anyway. But this looks like this will work fine. It gives me a little footprint. And it gives me a chance to check this. Now, in the next crutch I make, and if I had a cup, geez, if I had a, if I had a more another lifetime, what I'd do is I'd sink a little piece of wood like this, hardwood or maybe plywood, the multiple laminates, right into the crutch, so that I could just grind off the carbon from the one side, and then the nuts would drop right in there. But right now, this will be a good. Well, everything I can do, every little upgrade helps a ruler up very carefully with what my dimension has to be. So now I need to figure out the thickness of the doublers. I'm going to have to make a new set of doublers and figure out what size material so that it brings me out to F2. Now obviously, yeah, obviously I'll be real careful to check this about every five minutes for the rest of my life. All right, so here we have a couple hours into this project, and already we have the crutch ready to put in. But I still need to make those, oh, these doublers. I need to come up with something that's exactly that thickness now, because that's, that's something, again, that's going to be critical. Now, because we have patterns for everything, and because I have that fuselage already made, this second one is going incredibly fast. And I have a, I'm down, what I'm doing, I'm downsizing each one of the pieces of material in thickness. I can see right away by having that first piece that I way over engineered that one. Even though that one was coming out relatively light, I think this one will even be better. So maybe in the long run, this will give me a chance to even do a little more experimenting. And I can get all these parts made up tonight. And tomorrow I can start assembling things. And I'm going to make that change to the, to the fuselage that, uh, that I should have made in the first place. But so you having all that information from the first time through, now going by and making up the material, relatively, relatively straightforward. Now this is the key dimension that I needed to have. And this is something I haven't, I hadn't figured out. Uh, by, I bypassed in the first shot. What I did, I did this a little bit different. I made up the whole tank box, the tank shim, and everything, all in one piece. And then I'm going to insert that into the shell. Just maybe that's a little bit easier than doing it. But again, this is how you learn. You go through. You know, there's no way to go to school and learn this. Nobody's going to, you know, go to Berkeley, Anaheim University and figure this out. Anyway, this dimension here is the critical one. This is ready to put in a shell, and probably by the end of the session, we'll have a shell in one piece. Now, what's handy about this system of making up the whole nose section before I insert it into the shell, I can do things like getting the, the clearance around the header, get it finalized before I ever even put it in the shell. So just a few little things. There's a few little improvements I've made along the way, and having that first fuselage already made is certainly uh, making the second one go a lot quicker. Another little detail improvement that I made was to the second fuselage is putting a nose ring in before I glued a crutch in. That saved quite a bit of time as opposed to the other way I was doing it. But keep in mind, each time I'm working on this, I'm making it, I'm trying to make it a little bit better and better. And obviously the third one will have even more improvements on it. Again, by having a whole crutch and tank box all made up at once, it, first off, it made the alignment a lot easier. And just a matter of letting this dry. While this is drying, I'm going to do some sanding on that silver.
Okay, now while our crutch is drying up here, we have some time to flip-flop back and forth into our silver. But the whole purpose of silver is to pick up little mistakes like this. You can see the little imperfections. Now, if you were to paint this part white, you wouldn't see that at all. In fact, in the final finish, you more than likely won't see it. But if you're a perfectionist, you want to have everything just so. You can see, number one, there's no grain to deal with anymore. But there are little, little spots like that that I want to take care of. Now, I generally don't have to sand the whole part down, but I will. And if I have to, see, here's a little spot. Believe me, you can get to be a crazy man going back and forth over and over again, but it pays to take a little time, look it over. And if, for instance, if you're satisfied with this, hey, no problem. But a lot of times you're looking for that last little bit. You want to make that plane just perfect. So what I do is I take some 600 sandpaper, and some Sickens M600 and just look for any little flaws that come up. And I can patch, now I have a choice here, I could patch this with this, with the green putty. I could just put another coat of filler in there with a brush or I can sand down by it. See, the whole objective here is not to put a lot of paint on a plane. So by sanding down, let's say there's a mountaintop and a valley. Well, if you fill a valley, you can picture this is getting heavier and heavier. If you constantly sand in a mountaintop, it's getting lighter and lighter. So step one is I'll sand this down just to see how this is material. Now this has been drying up by a heating vent for three or four days. This should sand relatively easily. Now 600 sandpaper, just for anybody that might not, might not understand, wet and dry paper means that it will work in water. It'll work in any number of chemical solvents, but I still like Sickens M600 as the first choice. Also, the 600, the, the bigger the number, the finer the grit. 600 is just about right for sanding down silver coats, silver and filler. Probably another thing you want to have is some ventilation, a fan going. This is kind of a, it can be smelly. It's a degreasing fluid. It can be rough on your hands. If you have nice office worker hands, you might not want to get them all dirty and silvery. Here's all the information if you need to find a local distributor. But in the final finish, this is a material that I find, I've kind of pioneered the whole use of it. If you can tolerate the smell and the little, the bad effect it'll have on your skin, or you can wear rubber gloves. But, but this material, for modeling purposes, if you use it with ventilation and constantly wipe it off, this will give you the finish, just unbelievable how nice it cuts. Going to do any serious finishing, what I suggest is you get a bottle like this to put the Sickens M600 in. Again, I try not to leave any steps out. This is their order number, the part number 41789, phone number 216 425 3900. Now, the reason is these, these bottles spray and they put on a nice mist. You can't take the material out and put it in a bowl. It's just not possible to do that. And the reason it works so well is because it evaporates extremely quickly. It doesn't go down into the wood like water or any other windshield washer fluid and make a problem for you. So in this case, I'll probably just sand the whole plane down. The whole, the parts are not, they're not that difficult to sand at this point. You get an idea of how much Look at this, we have a brush hair in there. The one spot in the world I picked, it's buried in the finish. But now you can even feel how nice it is. And any spot that's a problem, let's say we go over to this spot, keep the sandpaper wet, keep it flushed. You can use a little sanding block. We want to basically look for any little flaws that we're not going to be happy with. I mean, what I'm motivated by is when I put a, a model out on the appearance judging at the Nets, I like to have it my best effort possible. I don't like it to be a convenience thing where, oh yeah, I saved two hours on this, or saved an hour on that, but now I got, you know, I hope nobody sees that. No. Let them look until the cows come home. Let them look forever and try to find a mistake. And when you feel that way, it takes a little time to put that extra little effort in. Now see, that'll, in the final coat of silver, we're basically done with anything with talcum powder in it. From this point on, all the silver is just going to be straight Brodac silver.
You notice I always start on the small pieces first. I like to get the, the, the small pieces because if the paint is still too soft or if I'm going to go into a second session or third session, I want the bigger parts to be the ones that have the extra dry time. But this looks like it's going to be fine. Now all we'll need is a day where the weather's decent to spray, but this will be all ready, ready to sit in a rack, ready to spray. The parts, once I start working on them, I really get fussy. You can see I've already picked up a little floor in there. Something this big I'm going to need to put green putty in. Work the edges, get the edges really down tight. And I always have that block that has that little offset edge so it can get down into those crevices. I have the rubber polywogs. But to get all of the little areas, all the little edges, usually out here where this ends, because you're carrying this stroke up and this one right in the back, there's a little high spot you always need to dress off. Anyway, this goes. When the paint is dry, this silver sands so quickly. I mean, in a matter of an hour or two, you can have the whole plane done. Now, what's, what's worth mentioning here is when I'm all finished, I get rid of the block and just go over everything again by hand. A lot of people, this is the part of it that, like when people are over the shop for the first time sanding out their first silver, they want to know how much to leave on. Well, obviously, you don't want to sand it all off and you've defeated the purpose of it. You just want to leave it in the low spots. Now, I know right there there's a low spot I need to work on. Well, I don't want to go back down any further. I might need an extra coat there. I don't know. Now, this little piece here, I know I'm going to get a little of that, the green putty in there. Once I get done with the hand sanding, give that 10 minutes to dry, and you can sand it right out. Now see this side has a little bit more on now right here I haven't done this side by hand but this side now with that amount of material on there I'm only about a few seconds away you can see how quickly it comes off and this is one of the steps that I don't like to take a skimp on even if I have to sand a model at six seven eight times I want to know that it's the best I can make it. I don't want to do it and say, oh gee, I saved an hour, I saved a, a nickel, or I saved a... I want to save everything. I just quit and go watch The Simpsons. What I want is perfection. I want it to be as good as I can, within the, the boundaries of what I'm able to make. And I don't want to sand it all off either. I want to leave just, that looks about right now, to me, by my way of thinking, that's about right. And when I say, now people laugh at me, that I say putty, like it's a putty cat. The number is, it's made by 3M, spot repair, 05960. Now a lot of times, here's a good trick. A lot of times this will get hard on you. See, I loan this out to somebody. I get it back, the cap isn't on tight. Now that first little bit is going to be dry. So what I do is get rid of about an inch of this and then mix a little bit of thinner in there. And one of the things, like I said, when this material dries out, this first little blob is usually... Now, of course, there's a way around this. You just go buy a new tube every year. I think I've had this since I was 10 years old. Anyway, you never... One tube, it'll last a lifetime. You, the thing you don't want to do with this is try to build a fillet or build anything that has structure. That first little bit is usually not going to be good. A little bit of thinner, a little bit of retarder, even a little bit of acetone. Just a few drops makes it a little more liquidy. I just like it to be a little thinner because I'm only looking to do little tiny. Keep in mind, this is, ma this is made to do body work on cars. Well, you know, you don't want to put this on thick either. You want two or three thin coats, always better than one thick coat. You can even drag some of that in there, just like mixing concrete. Why do I always say that? Just about that consistency. I'd say the consistency you want is peanut butter. As in all composite work, mayonnaise and peanut butter are the two, or two of, the consistencies you want to strive for. I would say right now that's going to be just about right. It'll have a dry time of about a half an hour. There's that little flaw that we're looking to fix. And the slightest little bit will do it. If you're doing small areas, you can even use a razor blade. Give that a half hour to dry, once that's dry, and I, I may as well look around. I don't see any other big spots, though. This one here probably could use a little shot, too. Because once it's dry, it just sands right out. It's no problem at all. 
little spot down here where I can see that's not not going to be real happy with that later on. But once you make a little batch, you can go around a whole plane. Remember, you just don't want to use this to do, we'll put a little bit in there even. You don't want to do like a major part of your finishing with, with either this or body shop filler, either Bondo or whatever. Okay, half hour from now we'll work on another part. Half hour from now we'll sand that out. And possibly tomorrow we can get another coat of silver on this. The retarder will make it dry slower. So if you're if you're looking like I am always looking to prolong the use of the material, retarder is better than thinner. If you're looking to make it quick, acetone is better than thinner. And thinner is right about in the middle. We've had trouble with our going over the carbon in the spots where there's been little sand through spots with fish eyes and fish eye remover didn't totally fix the problem. But I was able to make an appointment with the people at Randolph and speak to their head chemist, George Anderson, who is going to be making me up in the next week or two some real, real high-tech primer for specifically for the carbon parts. So what I'm going to do, I'll sand this out and put another coat of silver on it, but I'm not looking to get a final finish on this because on the other fuselage, when I have this, I'm going to wait for the George primer. The the real, I'm, I'm assuming he's going to do a little test since he's invited me down there to do the, the test right down there at the Randolph factory. When you start to sand a carbon fiber part, you can see how it leaves a little bit of the silver right in the little grooves and little places that, this is the Brodak primer down in there. It leaves the little specks right in the valleys. Now I'm leaving on just even a little more silver than normal on this because I'm hoping I'm not going to have those pinholes come back through to finish. So we'll find out when we go to spray it tomorrow. These little areas that we we put basically look for any little flaws, try to take care of them, and get another coat of silver on the whole part. Okay, as soon as I get these little spots sanded out, I'm going to get outside. Hey, hopefully, hopefully today we can get a little pain done. It looks pretty gloomy out there, though. Pretty cold and gloomy. Just another absolutely beautiful day here in Anaheim. <laughs> oh, God. Feels like it's going to snow again tonight. Anyway, I wanted to go over. Basically, let's see how this is. See if any of these areas that I worked on are going to be improved. And even if they're not, we'll go through, we'll give this a couple days to dry up by the heating vents and then sand it again. There's no end to the amount of sanding you can put on silver when you want to fill in those final floors. Now, I didn't want to put the last coat of silver on until I get all the final fits along the edges of this on the carbon fuselage. I figured another couple of days up here of drying wouldn't hurt while I'm working on the carbon fiber parts. I also put an additional, and I wasn't happy with, there's a lot of flaws in this that I can still see, so I put another coat of Brodak white primer on that. Obviously, I let that dry up by the heating vent, sand that off and possibly get away with one or two more sandings of the silver, but in the meantime, I can work on the carbon fiber parts. This came in from Paul Winter today, and he was showing me, because he has been watching all the tapes, he's been showing me what the English do. Of course, they, they use bolts in compression, and I had somehow misstated this on the video from looking at Paul's drawing. I guess uh, I didn't really understand it, my own fault. Anyway, they, I put the bolts in shear, but obviously if they're in compression, you can do that also. The other thing too is, they have a bolt that goes through the top of the fuselage, and it goes down into the, I guess, the plywood. Now, I hadn't noticed that. Shows you how observant I am. <laughs> 
But anyway, I appreciate this little drawing from Paul of how the English, and obviously they've been successful with it. I, in, in fact, when I did the two bolts here and I realized I needed another bolt up there, hmm. Well, in our case, and, I, and I'm going to save this drawing, in our case, if we wind up with some kind of vibration, there's no reason we can't put a bolt, because I'll have this, this piece already sticking out of the wing. There's no reason I can't put a bolt right up there. So anyway, I appreciate that from Paul Winter today, a good little uh, upgrade of our knowledge. One thing I like about sanding out the Brodak primer, first off, if it's a carbon fiber part, you really don't have to use M600 because there's no wood involved, only the little wood strips on the bottom. But I wanted to show this just about how much I like to leave on before I put the next coat on, because what I'm trying to do is fill in these little, little pit mark areas where I've sanded through. And I'm realizing, see, I'm learning as I'm going with this, that the Brodak primer, really, you could sand this about 20 minutes after you paint it. It really doesn't have to dry overnight. So in a case like this, I can start a day, sand this down, get a coat of primer on it, and an hour later, I could put another coat on if I need to keep filling in these areas. It looks like I'm getting pretty close. I'm going to put one more coat on, but here's what I wanted to show. As soon as it starts coming through, I know I'm finished because I want to leave the primer in those little valleys. The spots that we worked on yesterday, you can see that the high spot is coming through, the high spot is coming through. That's okay. Now, all I need to do is just get right in these areas, and you can see where you, where I where I putty, I should say putty, putty. Now I want to go in this direction, because in this direction I'm killing the edge. I have the corner knocked down about as well as I can. I just want to get right in that edge. Because I'm closing it, I may only need one or two more coats of silver here. But I want to keep those edges clean. And anything that looks like a bubble, I want to slit it, put pinholes in it, put some thin CA on it. I want to get all those edges knocked down. It's always these little corners and edges that can be a problem later on, especially if you live in an area where your plane is out in the sun for any length of time. You know, here, this, this edge is pretty good, but I want to, I want to get a little ramp going into it and I'm just using that little body shop uh, spreader with some sticky back paper then I'm going to go over the whole thing again with 600 just to scuff it up and hopefully I always, I always say every coat of silver is the last coat but then I look at it and I say eh clean it up clean up but now from this here's a little spot right here I want to fix now I can feel it. Even though that looks a little funny because there's a dry spot there, I can get rid of that. This side up here looks pretty good. But I want to get the ramp. I'll call it a ramp. The ramp that goes into the fillet. Should be only one more day and we'll be caught up on all the work on our carbon fuselage. I haven't been putting a lot of it on video because basically it's redundant except for anything I've changed. But it real, I, I just think of what it would take to recarve everything if you were doing a carve job and a work from wood job. It's certainly a lot less time. Now you can always sand with steel wool. Sa steel wool basically works like sandpaper. This is this is really four zero steel wool, the finest. It's the finest grade. And here's one area where I like steel wool a little bit better than sandpaper. When I want to do a spot touch-up, the sandpaper tends to put an angle in there. But once I get the corner the way I like it, I can get in that corner with the steel wool because I really don't want to have to, you know, repaint the whole part as such. I just want to get in that area and get a little, like up here, this is fine. I don't want to have to re-sand and repaint that. And there's a little logic to this. See, a lot of people spend a lot of time doing things that don't matter. In the overall, let's say they're going to spend 100 hours on a finish, and, and they spend 30 of them on something that doesn't even matter, or it's a waste of time, or it just duplicates effort. Where if you concentrate the effort, and in our case, this is the area we want to fix. This is going to be fine. So I want to spend as much time on the areas. Now, this is where we had a little touch-up yesterday. And I just hit it with that little sandpaper, and then this, this lets it blend in 
when I respray the silver that it just fogs right in and you don't even see it. And this area over here was a little, right down here there was a little spot. But it really, it's just up to how fussy of an, you know, it's your airplane. And if you decide you want to make it museum quality, concourse quality, or, you know, so it, it, this is the individual part of it that, that makes the hobby, to me, a very exciting. That you can pick how much, as long as you're willing to sand. It's like drag racing. As long as you have the money, you can just keep going faster and faster. In our event, money doesn't really have a big factor. It's how much energy you're willing to expel to make something perfect. All right, that should be almost ready to paint. You can see how we've gotten in those corners, and there's still some little low spots. And as long as there's low spots, that means it needs one more coat. And at last, I think this might be the last coat of silver. Yeah, I, I'm hoping. <laughs> Even though there's still some little spots in here, yeah, you could... When this dries, I'm going to go through it, check all the edges again. But I think that's pretty much pretty much ready and if I need another coat of course I'll make the decision tomorrow but we'll let this sit up by the heating vent now no matter how many times you sand this and I keep track of the weight every time I sand it and repaint it it never gets any heavier because you're taking off more material a lot of times it'll get lighter as you sand it in this case this part went down two grains because I took a lot of the silver off next step is I want to get the, the same definition in the lines see the thing is if you just do this you wind up with a ditch you've got to come up on that angle from both sides by the way this little a spatula or whatever you call it is just real handy for this again I'm starting to get real fussy because I really want this even though one of these fuselages I will, you know, just be using as a test model. I really still want them both to be as, you know, as nicely finished as possible. By the way, we now have the purple, the Miss Ashley red, the Ag Cat yellow, and the Voodoo, the color that Voodoo is, the purple, in stock. Anybody that's looking to make one of those type of paint jobs, the real bright purple, and of course the Miss Ashley red, in stock. Okay, we're finally ready, which for what we hope will be, keep in mind, we've been hoping for this for a long time, we hope this will be the last coat of silver. And it looks like we have Anaheim weather, 34 degrees and the wind is howling out there. We need a couple extra touch-ups, and we're still grinding away at these little edges and areas in here. Whoops. Anyway, the main thing is up by the nose, all these little scoops and edges. One thing anytime I'm doing silver is to constantly shake the gun. Constantly. Ooh, it's cold out here. Should be cold. Anyway, the prediction is possible snow this afternoon or tonight, so that's why we're rushing to do this instead of work on the carbon part. Again, trying to use the timer to the best advantage. Now each time you add a coat, you really don't have to coat the whole thing, you can just blow that wind is blowing. It's got a leaves blowing away. Here. You can just selectively go over the areas. But the Brodax silver really covers so nice. It looks like we have our problem solved with the pinholing on the carbon. Again, more on that when I go to put the red and white on. As of now, the silver is perfect. Perfect is in the eye of the beholder, that's for sure. Anyway, I really think I should have put a coat on. Whew. Well, one of the plans is possibly next year we're going to have the garage set up with a real spray booth with heat and fans and things like that. So this may be the last year we have to... Here's the, here's the worst spot on the whole plane right now. It's right up there. 
And I'm just going to try to give that a couple extra coats. One of the things I've been monitoring, because I didn't put any Brodac primer on the carbon parts, since this is really a hybrid fuselage, still has the... Now on a day like today, when a wind is blowing, you're really glad that you don't have the plane in one piece. And as soon as I can finish up that center of the wing, I can get the final silver on the wing. Hard to hold it steady. Anyway, the Brodac silver, using it as a way of fixing the flaws. There's probably other ways. See, there's that other bad spot. Just give it a couple extra shots. I know that's a dry, I call it a dry spot. There was a spot right along the fillet in there I needed to address. Just real nice material to work with. Okay, that's going up by the heating vent tonight. Finally get to work on this carbon fuselage a little bit. Too cold to be outside. And we have a couple of flaws on this part, but at least we have the silver now. At least the pinholing on the control. All right, in today's mail, take a close look at this before I go work on that carbon fuselage. Take a close look at this. This is really something special. This is from Paul Walker. Now, this is all Brodak dope. Paul needed some dope in a real hurry. Look at a plan on the wall. I wish he'd send me a set of these plans. Maybe I'll build one. But now, just looking at this, and I'm thinking, what an appropriate piece to mold. Wow. And just looking around, I imagine how labor-intensive it is to carve all this out of balsa wood. Um, really, really a piece of artwork. You have museum quality stuff. Hope to see this at the, well, somewhere. He'll be at the World Championships when uh, we're at the Nats. But, well, I hope we get some footage of this, some video, something. Paul, hey, this is, this is probably the most awesome semi-scale plane ever, but really cool. And, by the way, has carbon fiber motor mounts. Howard Rush has uh, engineered up some carbon fiber mounts. I don't know if they're similar to the ones we have come up with, or maybe, maybe not, I'm not sure. It's not a contest who can invent parts. I think Howard Rush, in fact, had the first carbon fiber gear I ever saw. Uh, don't know how many he's made or sold, but I know we've sold quite a few. Anyway, uh, thanks to Paul for the picture, and he promised he would send us a bunch more pictures. Appreciate it a whole lot. By the way, to finish on this is all Brodak dope, and what he has... I thought this was worth mentioning. He had put on the flat coat, the military flat coat, and then gone over it with clear. So he has the right color and the shine. Look how nice this is. Just take a look at some of the, the little features of this. The little gun blisters and... Really nice. Now what I've been trying to do is follow step by step the way I laid this out the first time. Needless to say, I'm trying to come up with some little improvements. Now, the first one, obviously, the next step is I'm going to have to lay out the wing cutout. But what I did on the first one, I laid that out with a template. So now by having all these templates, well, you can figure it out. This goes a lot quicker. In fact, this is going surprisingly quick. I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering how quick this is going to be actually by the end of today if we get the wing cut out trying to plan this out in my mind we get the wing cut out we can lay out where the wing is going to go we'll almost be caught up to as if this never happened and we'll also have the second fuselage which uh, is some merit to having an extra fuselage that's for sure All right, I'm going to get ready to lay out that wing cutout. Now, how do you like this? This came from John Grigsby. Now, I know I've been saying Grisby, but his name is Grigsby, with a G. Now, see, he's been watching the videos and picking up on how to make, well, how I make it anyway. Not that my way is the only way, that's for sure. And these are molded to Bob Gieske's shape. 
You see what he did? He made a little balsa rib inside, but it's really nice. Beautiful workmanship. And these are really super, super light. Super light. Now, my only concern with this would be that it might even be too light. Well, you, if it doesn't break, it's not too light, but that you'd get some fluttering or maybe, I guess we'll find out. These really look beautiful. Now, I'm going to see carbon to me is uh, really overkill when it comes to making wheel pants, but obviously people, if somebody wants them, this is a great way to do it. And as always, he has a lot of other products. John Grigsby in Pampa. He makes some clevis ends and things that might interest you. So it'd be a great thing to have in your arsenal. And I think those are just super. I hope we're going to... Uh, well, we're making up new molds for all wheel pants, too, but I hope someday soon we're going to have something very similar to this. Or maybe we'll just ask John if he'd like to mold them. Hey, that's an idea I can live with. Anyway, John, thanks a lot. Now, here's a photo of his molds, very similar to mine. He made a rubber mold, RTV. The carbon layup. Well, it looks real nice. Anyway, I, lo I just love the idea that a lot of new products are coming out on the market. A lot of people are learning. We're sharing the information, helping each other. I just think that's great. Again, thanks, John. Well, it looks like we finally, finally... <laughs> this is about where we left off when we realized a couple days ago that we didn't have... <laughs> wing didn't fit. Well, this looks like it's going to fit. Now, what I do is I left on a little extra material... Because I know that this is my parallel line, and I want to line it up with these two and with the center line. I know this center line is exactly the same dimension, so I can work off there. So now what I'm going to do is constantly just grind away at the high spot, little by little, drop it down, drop it down, until all my center lines in all four corners line up. And that's what I would have done with the original one had I been able to get the thickness Boy, that's not even off by it. I don't even think I'll have to sand it. That's so close. Another precision job. <laughs> so the answer is never leave out the doublers. And then once I get all the center lines in and I have that bulkhead, I have it already made, I can just drop that in there, get all the bolts in. I need to, once this is lined up, then I need to, what I'm going to do is spot these two holes. And then I have a template for the third hole to put in the back. What I need to do is get this to go up that amount. So what I'm going to do, but remember I made this purposely low because I want to use this wing in many fuselages, and it's sticking out half of that amount, about a sixteenth of an inch. So what I'm going to do is lay another piece of tape right about in the middle of that and take half out at a time until this very, you can see it's not even a bad fit. Now that this and the line that's parallel in the back walk right up to the center line. Well, I'll just take half of that amount at a time. I think we got, we're going to get halfway up to the line, do another test fit, but I think I'm going to wind up right at the line. I want that, because what I'm looking for is to have this bottom piece line up. So as long as I maintain parallel, I can move that wing up and down, you know, a 32nd of an inch or as much as I need to, but I need to keep these two center lines exactly lined up. And then when they're all lined up, then I can spot drill those holes in the front former. And once that's attached in a very rigid manner, then I can glue in the back former. Now that I have a real good, what well, I hope is a good alignment, I needed to put a, a little shim in here just to take up the clearance and get this lined up. Well, now I'm going to take, put some tape on it. Well, I don't even need it. It's raw wood. And get a ballpoint pen to mark the two spots and just drill these two. I only need to work with the two holes right now. Then once this is nice and solid, then I can just shave the back little by little by little. I still need to shave just a little bit and get that to drop level. Spot the holes, it's real easy. I just try to think of a better way to do this. Well, see if you were only making one plane, it wouldn't be a problem. You could just not put this bulkhead in, bolt it to this piece, and slide it in. And it'd be all lined up to begin. Well, yep, but we already made this piece, so 
we want to have these interchangeable. So I need to have this surface here perfectly level and parallel, and I need to clamp these, which I've already done, and now I need to spot these real accurately through the blind nuts. So what I tried to do is take a blind nut and file a point on the front of it and just run it through the blind nut so it gives me two real accurate spots to work from. This part of it, because we have, we ha only because we have an interchangeable wing, is just taking a lot more time than, you know, than if you were only going to make one fuselage for a plane. I'm not going to concern myself with that third hole right now because I have a template, but I want to just drill these out real accurately, right on center. Now we'll see if this lines up before I drill that third hole. Some carbon fiber washers. And the next thing I'm going to do is just, I have the, uh, the post-cured epoxy dry in here. So we're just gonna, it's near the end of the session. I'm just going to let this dry overnight before I go on to the next step. We were making a plane where we only had one wing and one fuselage. We'd be able to do this, this exact same thing. I, what I did, I bolted the two formers together, put a piece of Teflon in between. So one former will set the other one in place. Uh, the way I made this and again, because I'm trying different methods, I can see that that would have been a lot easier. I had to shim that front piece with a piece of 64th plywood to get the alignment right. But even so, this will work. It's just that I know there's better and better ways of doing this, and I'm going to try to find all of them. Now I need to get a clamp. We have some of those big clamps. And then I'll let this dry overnight. Well, you can't do many things on these projects without the clamps. Take apart planes, and if you don't have clamps, I don't know how you could even do some of this stuff. Now I want to get a bead of this glue inside. Of course, the hole down, that Teflon will keep it from... Let's hope it keeps it from gluing itself together. I'll know in the morning when I come back down here. Anyway, the silver is cooking up, so the bathroom's bathrooming, the silver's silvering, this is cooking. One of these projects has to work out. Actually, I did think this was going to take a little longer than it did, but it looks like it went as well as I could expect. And then, of course, once this dries, we can put in all our little reinforcements. Come back in the morning and see how this is dried up. Now while that glue is drying, and again that secondary bonding epoxy really should dry overnight, to take advantage of a day that uh, I would normally have let this sit another day, but we're expecting snow, but there is no snow. And I noticed that it's bright and sunny out there early this morning, so I want to try to get the what I hope Every coat, I hope, is going to be the last coat, but I just get fussier and fussier. And you can see, this this is the point I want to make. As you get further and further into the sanding of the silver, about at the third or fourth coat, you're only going to see little spots. Here's that little spot we touched up, little spot there. But it just depends on how many times you're willing to sand it out. Here comes high spots up here. And if you're willing to spend the time, you know it's going to be perfect when you're done. The sanding silver method is one that I'm sure I'm, I didn't invent it, but whoever really does get the credit for inventing it, they realized early on it shows a lot more than if we were to go back and we're obviously going to be painting this pretty soon. When you paint this, you'd never see these things, but you'll feel them. Now, see, there's a low spot right there. You can see what a low spot, how it stands out, a little spot up on the valve covers. If you're just willing to pay the price, you can get it perfect, and I hope we can get this sprayed today. Every time I sand one of these out, I always keep thinking, this is the last time I'll have to do this. But then I get fussy. I come back in the morning, and I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, just The point is, don't drop it on the floor. 
is if you're fussy and if you're willing to just do this over and over and over again. And I am. <laughs> anyway, we're going to get outside. It is really brutally cold, but hasn't snowed at all. Get another coat of silver on this, and I hope, I really hope, we're looking at the last coat. And then we're going to work while this is dry and work on that carbon fiber body. Now, it's so cold out here, I couldn't even take video. Oh, they said it's 30 degrees. It isn't 30 degrees. Everything's starting to freeze up again. Anyway, I hope what you've got from this little lesson is just keep sanding, block sanding, working on the edges, and shoot another coat. And keep track each time that you're not adding weight. Sand off until it's lighter than the part that, uh, you know. In this case, we've added about two grams each time we've put a coat of silver on and then taken off sometimes two and a quarter. I don't know. So the part might be even lighter. I don't know. But the point is just be fussy and you will eventually, just like anything else in life, just takes a lot of patience and really a lot of hard work. But to me it's worth it. Now, because this is the thin shell with only two layers, what's happening is when I sand it in the nose ring, it got kind of thin. So I just put in, with the post-cured the post -cured, uh, secondary bonding resin, one more layer of light cloth. I'm going to give that a little time to dry, and then we're ready. The next step is going to be to take the wing out. I know I need to make a little shim up here. I needed to shim that. Now, see, again, that would be, it wouldn't be anywhere as near the problem it is now. If we were just making one plane, we would glue those bulkheads in while it was attached. But I'm trying different ways, seeing what's going to work for me. I'm not sure I, well, we're not sure we even can get the wing out until we take it out. It still has the Teflon paper in between the bolts. First little problem I notice is I I can't conveniently slide the wing out with this in the position it's in now. So I'm going to have to remove some of this material. I don't know how much. This is the this is the kind of thing obviously needs to be worked out on the first time around. This shim, I don't know if I need a little more or a little less, but I've just got it tacked in position. And other than that, the next step is to make sure that the wing comes in and out and it comes in and out the same as on a wooden body. Is the problem. I made this former way too long. I actually probably made it oversized in a way I didn't have to. So I'm going to see if I can just carefully, carefully with a Dremel tool sand some of that away. Basically do, I'm going to do it. I haven't done it yet. I need to make a little brace in the back here. Very similar to how I did on a wood fuselage, but I need to know, I need to remember in the future to make this, this clearance here just a little bit different. always do this after the fact but it would be easier once we have this all on in plan form of course it'll be a lot easier and I'll make a little piece of a uh, couple of pieces of 64th plywood in the back then once I can grind this a little bit more that wing will drop right in there now once that's glued in place now I'll just dress it off with the Dremel tool and then make sure the wing drops in and out see if I knew this ahead of time Again, this is this is why doing these things for the first time is it's an adventure. And if you know where you're going, it's not much of an adventure. It's redundant and boring. <laughs> not really. All right, that worked perfectly. The fuse drops right, the wing drops right in place. Now the next thing I need to do is get this, I need to trim the shim down and then figure out I have a pattern for the third hole and get that hole drilled in the tank box so that all three of those holes hold the front of the wing. Okay, what I did, and this may, be, may or may not be a big help, I had made some 64th plywood shims in here, and I figured out the ultimate thickness that this had to be. It needed to be about a 64th thicker on this side. So what I did, I just got sick and tired of cutting and sanding and everything. I took a piece of eighth inch light ply, ran it on a belt sander, and put that little bit of an angle in there. And it lined up relatively well. Now I need to let that dry, and then I'm going to basically do the fillets. This I'm, no point even putting them on video. They're exactly the same as on the the video that we did before. I'm going to line up the pieces of 64th plywood, let the epoxy dry overnight, and do the aeropoxy 
the next day. But this little shim, see, there's a lot of little things on this plane that took longer because it's the first time through. And obviously the next time, maybe I'll be more intelligent and, uh, well, not really. <laughs> I'll still be a dummy. Anyway, we'll try to... It, it's so complicated, I didn't realize how complicated it was going to be to have a, a wing that has this piece... Now this fuselage has to match every top, every angle, and n not that it's impossible to do, but I just, I don't like like we all do. I thought it would be easier. Now that I've seen it, I know it's doable. It just takes a little more time. Well, it takes a lot more time. Anyway, I have to let that bulkhead dry, and then tomorrow set up to do the aeropoxy, set up to do those fillets. I'm laying out the Teflon, the Teflon sheeting before I cut the piece of fly. But again, this is all redundant to the other way we did the fillets. Okay, now one of the things I really needed to do is I needed to remember not to get any glue right in there. And what I did, I shoved in a little piece of the Teflon paper, so let's hope it doesn't bond. And because this is thixotropic, I was able to shove it up under there. And now what I want to do is put a bunch of little weights on this. I also made a little tool, and I guess this is worth putting on a video. Just a little piece of balsa for making the equivalent of a radius on that to try to make it so when we put the aeropoxy on, it's not going to be sloppy. Again, this is pretty redundant, but, be, but I didn't do this exactly this way on the, uh, on the wood fuselage, so I thought it'd be worth putting that on. I guess you. I guess another thing you could do is use a little half a prop, but this seemed to work real well on the other side. And it makes a relatively nice. Just got to remember not to get any up on the front there. Well, when you're doing, see, this is the thing. When you're new to this, this take apart thing, like I'm sure people that do this all the time, Europeans or Kaz or Paul Walker or whatever, they, they know what steps get to be a pain and this is one of them but anyway we made that shim up I know one thing for sure in the future I'll have a lot of shortcuts I've learned everything the hard way oh see that is one the little piece came out the problem is with anything Teflon you can't even tape it in place but I wanted anything that touches the carbon to be secondary bonding epoxy so I could see if any of these joints were going to fail in service. I guess we're going to find out. But one thing I was real happy, I wanted to show this, one thing I was real happy about so far is this, this joint right here with those three bolts is like a rock. So I know at least at this point from here to the hinge line this is, this is every bit as strong as a wood if not stronger. Now the next thing I want to do, the last thing, is I want to put little weights all along the edge. I got to find something that's appropriate, an appropriate choice, because what, what I don't want to have is I don't want to have a lip here. I want to have that edge, and obviously it's going to be sealed. The Teflon makes up for the thickness of the paper. I want to get this down here too. That's the last thing is to figure out what weights are going to go on there, and then put that aside and work on the other plane. Okay, that's basically got to sit there overnight. Okay, in today's mail, this is from Ron Keith. This is his version of Strega. Oh, I like the paint job, beautiful paint job. I'm assuming it's all Brodak dope. Anyway, here's, here's something that really is important. We are in the final stages of rearranging the plans for the soon-to-be Strega kit. We have a lot of people that have pre-ordered the kit, and if you would like to add your name to the list, this is going to be a world-class kit. Trust me, this is probably going to be the best-selling kit of all time, the Strega kit, coming before the end of the year. But don't take my word for it. 
I just I just have a gut feeling this is going to be one of the best. This is probably going to sell better than a Cardinal kit. I hate to admit it, but uh, it probably will. Coming by the end of this year. Okay, the next step on this operation is going to be to trim these off, put some quarter-inch tape down the edges, trim them off. But I have a little a little plan that I want to work with today. Since I have a relatively long amount of time, gives you about a couple hours more than I normally would have, what I'm going to do is do all the preparation on this but not put the air epoxy on there until the end of the day. This way, all during the day while I'm doing other little projects, I won't be sticking my finger in here. Also, I'll take care of this little extra reinforcement. Oh, yeah, that's perfect. Take care of cleaning that up and get these ready so that the last thing of the day, I can put the air epoxy light on there. I'm trying to plan out an efficient use of the, 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 uh, the time today. Okay, the tape gives me a good edge, and it lets me keep it very symmetrical on both sides. And to match, well, obviously, we have to match the wing going in there. Again, the, the big problem with this whole project has been that we have to match things, where if we were just making one fuselage and one of everything, this, this would have cut the time down considerably. Tape is really handy acting as a guide. Here we all were while the white folk play. Pulling their bow from the dawn till sun. Let me go away from the Mississippi. Let me go away from the white man boy. Show me that street. Okay, next thing I want to do, I want to lay out where the formers are going to go where the pipe tunnel is going to end. I'm going to mark this all off with tape and where the push rod is going to go. And I'll know in between there, I'll try to lay out and see how many formers I need to make that as stiff as the ball apart. See, having that first wood fuselage, that'll give me a lot of the dimensions that I need. The next step is I need to get the Dremel tool out put the clearance in that front pipe mount that'll allow the, the pipe, the test fitting of the pipe of course and then next thing is to tape off, notice I'm doing this with the wing installed because at this point in time the, the body's still relatively flexible and I want to maintain the alignment between the tail, I want to every time I put a former in make sure I haven't cocked the body one way or another just need to match that cutout and that's relatively easy to do, I could just use the wing part as a template After cutting this out and getting a relatively nice cut, I just want to check that I haven't lost my, what is my center line. Again, I can imagine how, how much easier this is when you don't have to match. You just match one part to one part. There'll be plenty of clearance here for the pipe, the motor. I made this tank floor a little different. Rather than having the lightning holes, I had the piece in the front made it out of a thinner piece of carbon. Just a couple of little detail changes, but basically the same. Now I need to get the dimensions off of the wood fuselage and lay out tape where the pipe tunnel is going to be because I don't want to. I don't want to have any interference in that area. That should be relatively quick because we have all the dimensions we need and we know how. We know this. The wooden fuselage has plenty of clearance for the pipes that we're going to use. So it'll just be a question of marking off all these areas and building up some formers. Now I'm just using some masking tape to hold on that tailpiece. That sets the thickness at the back of the fuselage too. Because the first thing I want to do is just fill in that little area behind there. And see at this point I don't know how many formers I really need. So I'll just make up rough formers rather than real formers 
and just tack them into position till I see how many I'm going to need. What if we straightforward just making up these balls of formers and I have them just tacked in position so I can see. I want to, I guess I'm going to need two more or three more, but I don't know. As long as they're tacked in and I don't, if I don't feel I need that many, I can just break them out one at one another or I can add one in between. But the next thing I need to figure out is probably two in here is going to be enough, which probably means it'll need six. Well, it looks like three formers kind of stiffened that up as much as we need. I need the next thing to lay out the floor here, what will be the pipe floor. Well, tool, now that everything is semi-lined up, I can put a little bead of that post-security epoxy to secondary bonding epoxy. And by having that little end round, it gives me a nice little, relatively nice fillet which is what the bonding company, Gushan, recommends as a fillet. And then we'll be ready to put that tank floor in. Again, we've, we've gone through many times how to make formers up. The dimensions are all kind of, in this, relatively square and simple. Now what I did, I made this tank floor up from a piece of 30 second balls and then put cross grain on the other side. So it's two pieces of 30 second. And once I get this positioned, then I'll get some clamps on this, and put a little heat gun on it. Again, what I'm trying to accomplish is to get all the parts that touch the carbon to be done with this secondary bonding resin, especially up in the corner here. That's a, a critical area. and make sure I'm touching all the formers so I complete the box. Okay, next step, I'll let all that dry. I guess I can mount up the tailwheel too since we already have the tailwheel made. While that's drying, let me position and mount up the tailwheel. The mountain up the tail wheel. It looks like we really should put one more former right in here. We're just going to make up a dummy former. Yep. And we, we wound up with three inch spacing on the formers, so I, in the future I'll know that ahead of time and I can make these all up ahead of time. I'm going to make a little glue fillet in here and a little brace with uh, some scrap ball, so what I think, after I put that former in. Again, when I after after I had the thing all clamped up, I just grabbed the fusel to see how strong it was. It looks like we've got plenty of strength. If anything, we probably have one too many in there. Like everything on this project, it looks like we've over-engineered it a little bit. All right, now obviously this has to dry before we can get anything else done. Now, in making this joint, I won't be able to do that until the next session, but I thought I'd try something here. I need to make a little lip on this because what I don't want to have happen is these two pieces just try to join. It's going to be a weak joint. I want to have, in effect, a little lip on there. Well, it could be plywood, could be balsa wood. I don't know. We'll find out. But I wanted to have, and this is where it's handy to have this, just to see, an extra... We just happen to have an extra fuselage sitting here, and I can do my alignment, see how that'll fit. That looks like it's going to be fine, in fact. Now, if it isn't, I can just take a little bit of material off here with a sanding block. Again, I just need to line this. I'll do the same thing here. You can see what the shape is. I cut a little bit of a, made like a little piece of molding here, and just tack glued it in there. Once I have the shape that I want, then I'll, I'll run a bead of the... Uh, the good epoxy down there. But I think that'll make for a little bit better joint when we get to do this joint. And then, of course, this can be drying overnight, too. You can see I need to just take off a few thousands. Actually, I need to just take off the thickness of the carbon to make this joint happen. Now, if I were making this piece out of a rubber mold, I could mold a little lip in there like we do on the wheel pants, but, well, just the one, I just want to be able to 
see if this is a practical way of making these joints with this little little wood brace. Make that to put that little angle in a piece is just a question of a doing it by eye, getting a little edge on there. I thought in the beginning I'd need plywood for this, but I think the balsa wood will be fine. There's really no... Once that glue gets in there and oozes in that seam, you can just use up some scrap on that to just get that edge in there. Whoops. Get the clearance that I want on that edge. So, you know, what this will allow me to do, at least get some idea of on a joint that really isn't critical, if joining carbon fiber parts with a balsa shim is going to be strong enough. If not, we'll have to resort maybe even to making plywood shims, 64th plywood. And one other little thing I could really just take a little more material off here. I really only need about maybe even a sixteenth of an inch. I really don't need this much material. I can get my my sanding uh, contour sander and get in there. So I just have that little lip running along the edge. Yeah, a little contour sander will be real good for in here. And I can remove this material off here, the thickness of the, the real shell. I don't want to do it to that dummy shell that we have. And that should be a good, relatively good interlocking groove when I get to do that. Now we've already made a separate dedicated aeropoxy light video. There's no point in going back over that. I'm going to try to do this off camera early today so that it'll be dry for tomorrow. If you haven't seen it and maybe you're new to the videos, there is a separate dedicated video with all the aero epoxy light information on it. Okay, we just let that dry overnight. I just one other thing while the aero epoxy is drying. I need it, as Larry Cunningham has said eloquently in his article, to complete the box. And of course, without that sheet, now I know the carbon will complete the box also, but I want it to have all the structure in there so that that last little piece of carbon is basically just going along for the ride. The clamps on there, and, and now obviously the whole thing here needs to dry overnight before we can go on to the next step. Now, while well, we're taking a little break, in today's mail, some Pesquita's done. Great ship, Dan, and we really look forward to having a good year of competition this year. I was looking to see, a little bit different than the wood fuselage, by using the polywogs, if I was going to be able to get that nice smooth blend up into the carbon. And, of course, the first thing, aeropoxy light you want to make sure this really has dried plenty of time. We were working on that bathroom, so it actually got an extra day to dry. But it, it's always good to let it dry an extra day. Just sanding it out. Only takes a few swipes of the sandpaper and you have, once you can't feel that joint and it's powdering off, thing we learned for sure, the, the aero epoxy light really feathers into the carbon like butter. It, it's just, it's fairly ridiculous how easy that went. Now I made these fillets oversize on purpose because I know the challenge here is going to be to get this front to match up. So what I did, I used tape, ran a line on both sides, and now I can just with the Dremel tool and with a little dowel with some sandpaper just try to get these to match in the front. Now I know on the next ship I'll make this a little bit easier by moving the, the former in the fuselage forward by the thickness of this gap and it'll save me from having to make that little lip on there. So that's another little significant thing we learned in the uh, construction of this plane. Where to place that former. 
Phillips done. This this is something even I didn't expect. I mean, you talk about a stiff butt. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that's going to translate to in terms of performance, but that is the most rigid body I've ever built, period. You almost can pick it up and, and shake it like a rag mop. Anyway, that was something I didn't expect, and it just shows that I've over-engineered every part of this. On the next fuselage, each part of this I'm going to lighten up by some amount. Okay, the next thing I want to do, I cut out that carbon fiber web that was in here, and I know, yeah, I could have used it, maybe, I'm not sure. But I wanted to be able to adjust this, get some fine tuning on it. So what I'm going to do is make an eighth inch light ply floor in here with the blind nuts. Now see, if I use the carbon piece, I'd have to accommodate the blind nuts. If I use the light ply, I can just use it just the way it is. And I need also to make a, a former in the back because I have this, I'm going to try to use this last piece, so I need to line up that bolt. And I also need to make up this bulkhead in here. I'm going to make them all out of light ply, eighth inch light ply. Okay, we can only epoxy in one piece at a time, so we'll get this piece in first. While this is drying, I'll make up the front piece and the what, what will become the platform for the stadium. Okay, right, once that dries, then I can make up that bulkhead that fits in the back. Now, I'm using the tailpiece itself to try to set this former in, even though at this point in time I don't know if I'm going to have to make a new tailpiece. I'm not sure. It looks like we're close, but if it's not really perfect, I don't want to use it. So, by having this piece, I can set that former in, grind a little more carbon away. I, I always want to have something to set that former in place. Again, we run into that same problem where this piece needs to fit two airplanes or else we wind up making two pieces. By using a piece of tape around the edge, it just gives me a nice little line to work with before I can set that former in and that former will be set. I'll just press it in with the tailpiece. But epoxy's drying. I'm just using this, the tailpiece from the wood plane, as a uh, kind of a, a hold down guide. Once that epoxy dries, and I can go on to the next step. It worked out extremely well here, and I didn't know that it would. See, I'm I'm basically trying, lazy as I am, I'm trying not to have to make another back piece. Well. The front piece now lines up relatively well. I put a little shim in here, oversize, and now now I have a gap up here of about 20 thousandths, maybe, maybe more. I made it nice and sloppy. And what I want to do, every time I shave this, this, this joint gets tighter. So by sanding this down, I can control how tight I make that joint. And needless to say, I'll do this a little bit at a time. Now every time I take a little shaving of that off, you know, I just need to take just a little bit more off. And it looks like I'm going to, well, we'll find out. I'm going to get away with only having to make one of these. Now, I found very handy that I already have this tailpiece made because I just pressed it in position, put a piece of pointed music wire in there, and I had the location of the blind nut. But basically, God has smiled on us, at least temporarily. The screw tight, I can see how much of a gap I still have. So it's this amount of material I want to remove. I'm probably going to wind up removing almost all of that little spacer that I have to make that former. And that'll move that tail section. It should close that gap. And I should be ready to move on to the next step.
and that gap worked out just about right. I guess every once in a while we luck out by random. And a little piece of copper tubing so that this hole wouldn't wear and this part start getting loose. out the hole for the tail wheel, same as the, the wood fuselage, and I need to make little notches in here where the formers are going to stick up, and that'll allow this little lip to catch in there and hold the fuselage in position, or maybe we'll have to tape it in position. And that'll allow the formers to sit in there. Oh, that bottom block seam is really, really almost flawless, and on this side you can see I've been real aggressive and sanded it so thin that the balsa is coming through but it's still nice and solid because I have that little that little if I can even see it when you look this way that little piece of balsa anyway that worked out near perfect the next step of course is going to be to get this piece laid in with all the fits and angles and everything that we need to work on on that okay today what my objective is is I'm going to try to get the mounts, the holes cut. I have three extra ones just in case and Elliot has one. I made four of these up so far. Now the objective here is I want to see if I can improve on the cowl mounting system and I've been using the three screws maybe I'll just copy it over but I, I will do a little fooling around if I come out with something a little bit better obviously that's one of the things I'll put on a tape but it, unless I come up with something that's either a little bit better or an improvement we've already done this on tape and you just need to all the subscribers if that's something you're going to do just play the tape back it'll be relatively the same the fits the edges the hold downs but if i come up with some improvement i'll definitely include that in on the tape the nice thing is because we've done this once already we have a real good idea of what we can and cannot do in the beginning, I thought I'd be able to get away with one bolt. Now I know I need three. And I have a little bit thicker nose ring, so I may need to do a little adjustment on that. But basically, it's going to be very similar. And I hope within one or two sessions, I can have that bottom block installed. Now, as we close in on having this finished, one of the things that uh, is it's so apparent to me now and I doubted it all along. I really had my doubts whether this was ever going to come to fruition. But from this point on, I think it's all downhill. I mean, we could fly the plane, assuming we had a tail. The nose construction seemed to work out okay. The tail, the joining, a lot of the things I've had to improvise here look like they're working better than I could have ever dreamed for. And I have a spare fuselage to boot as a side benefit. Just one more handy use for this Teflon paper that Dave Midgley gave me. While I'm gluing in the nose ring and trying to line up the cowl, I had forgotten about the, the Teflon paper until the last minute. I said, oh, I could see glue drooling down there, so you can see it coming there. So I just slide in some of that Teflon paper. It's great to have some of that in, in the shop. They're real useful stuff. Now, believe it or not, we have really lucked out and hit a nice little pocket of reasonably 50, 60 degree weather. And the Brodak dope is just beyond good. Just drying up beautifully out here in the sun. It's a great time of the year to be living in New Jersey. Well, a good time anyway. Every day we work on our pond a little bit, work on the airplanes a little bit, work on the Brodak dope a little bit, and we still have four baby fish. So we're hoping soon, our indoor fish are mating, soon we're going to have some more fish, and summer is flying season's coming. Now I realize because of that bad spot that we lost on the tape, that this is one of the details might have been lost. I lay out the pipe mounts that way, that the... Uh, and then just cut this piece off. I'm gonna make little reinforcements on this. It's all eighth inch light ply. I also glued the last little bit of this, and of course that's gonna to have to get sanded out, and I'm gonna to have to make the 
Got a little dump door in the back. This probably would be okay, but I'd feel better if that were reinforced. Just little triangles with the grain going corner to corner, not this way and not this way. Corner to corner. This is really the easiest way that I know of, is just make them, and again, you notice that that grain goes corner to corner. Oversized, when they're all done, I'll dremel them in, and everywhere there's a little mount, I'm going to triangulate all the mounts in both the shell and both this part here. But what I do is just make up a whole bunch of them, mix up the, uh, the post-bonding resin, and one by one just lay them in place. When I made this this change to the what is now the uh, the carbon bottom, I wanted to know that I could make this joint just by joining two pieces with a little shim of balsa and by doing it along the edge with a little shim of balsa. I wasn't sure if I'd need to make a piece of carbon, a piece of uh, whatever, but believe it or not, carbon fiber sands and blends. Of course, it's messy and you don't want to breathe this stuff in but it sands relatively easily. It doesn't sand a whole lot different than probably 12 pound balsa wood, but the difference is it doesn't bend at all. Now, now what I've gotten, and this is, this is my rig. I want to get this. This was one of my, my little good ideas. See, the sandpaper doesn't seem to wear out from carbon the way it does with wood. As soon as I sand a piece, I take an ordinary paper towel, and just get rid of the dust. Just get it out of the environment. Is the dress off all the extra uh, post-bonding resin that drooled out here. The orbital sander seems to be the easiest way to do that. about finishing carbon fiber parts. You can do them by hand, but boy, an orbital sander just makes it a piece of cake. It actually go right up on a whole part. Not like sand and balsa wood where it's very delicate. Everything is solid. And the last little bit I want to do with a sanding block. I don't want to get too carried away here. Okay, now how many hours you got into sanding this? How many coats you got on here? I got three coats. Three coats of silver? Yeah. This is Rich's Strega wing. Oh, that's coming out nice. You, just, you definitely have too much silver on here. Still you know that sand. you could sand it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, sand it off. I mean, you've got enough. And the sanding is nice on here, but you've got too much. You know, it's just going to be too heavy. How much does a wing weigh? Did you weigh it? I didn't weigh it. I have some tape in here. Yeah, up the, uh, yeah. Yeah, it looks real nice though, much nicer than last year's. So you could put an extra coat here where the joint is. Right. That would be okay. Wouldn't hurt to have that joint filled. Let's see what else you could pick away at here. Mm, that's a little spot up there. You could put a little the putty in there. Other than that, that looks pretty decent. Up here, see, I can yeah. feel that. Yeah. That you could just. Just spray just that area just a little bit. Here's another little spot. I'm doing it with my hand. Do you think I should give it another coat, the entire wing? Or no, you should sand the whole thing down. Sand it down more. Yeah, here's a some kind of a funny spot yeah. right here. Yeah, I would just sand this all down. Get some sand M600, yeah. yeah. And then put on just a coat of silver. Nothing, you know, no, nothing else in it. Yeah, that's much nicer than last year's wing. That, that's a beauty. Okay. That's one you can be proud of. Well, wow, I have to write about this in stunt news. <laughs> that looks nice. Something good? You're going to write something no. good about me? Only if it's a mistake. <laughs> anyway, that really does. Richard Strega looks like he's ready to set the world on fire here. Now, is this going to be a, a full, a joint. I didn't full make a quality joint. job? This is not going to be a... I didn't make a joint on the... Uh, no joints, huh? On the, uh, I mean, a week from now, you're not going to come over here and say, Oh, gee whiz, I, you know... On the push rod. Invented something that, that hasn't been invented? A joint on the push rod. Okay. Yeah, that looks real nice. Okay, good. A good a good addition to your uh, modeling career.
Oh, in today's mail, and this is this is really something nice. In fact, I haven't made the push rod up yet, so it'll be real easy to figure out if I want to do this. These are real super light arrow. Wow, it is strong. Super light arrow shafts, and this is from Pat Johnson. He sent me some super light wheel collars. I don't know if you can see these up close. Look like something real nice from Pat Johnson. Of course, he's the one that copies all our plans for us. Let's see. Oh, here's his here, here's his business card. Dear Wendy, you look like you're gaining weight. <laughs> anyway, from Pat Johnson. And we have other cool stuff in the mail today. It's from my good friend Paul Winter, and he made me a special tool. This is to get in. It's a 13-inch long 440 Allen wrench to get in and tighten that one screw in the tank box in the Miss Ashley tank box. So, Paul, I'll tell you, this is a beautiful tool. And with, this is something I didn't realize we were going to need. I went to buy long Allen wrenches, and I realized they don't really make them. You have to kind of... I see what Paul did. He made a drilled and tapped some screws. Nice piece of work from Paul Winter. Now, Paul, as always, included in a couple of really nice books. In fact, whoop. Two-sided pull-out poster at a Battle of Britain Spitfire. Oh, well, okay. Now, on our trip to England, we got to see this guy in real life. This is really something to see in real life. Hey, I really, Paul, I really appreciate these books. I'm going to be sharing them with... Anybody would like to share these books, you know, when I send you tapes, I'll be glad to uh, get them in circulation. Really neat stuff. See, so, you know, because you, you typically can't buy these books in the United States, they're English. You don't see the same photos over and over and over that you see, like in the American books, I've seen the same picture of a Mustang 40 times. This, you, you generally get to see a whole new selection of things. Really like these books. See, now, I didn't realize this. This is really Ted Fancher <laughs> flying in with the gear up. That's something you don't see all the time. Now, look at the exhaust stacks on this. They must have them painted with that heat, that high heat paint, the white paint. Oh, looks like a B-29 there. Uh, uh, uh. Hey, all right. Duxford. I was in Duxford, and boy, that is one impressive museum. Whoa. Now, Vulcan is there. If I ever could get this footage converted, I have all this great footage. It's in PAL mode. And Paul Winter promised to have it all recorded for me. Uh, uh, uh. Paul, I need my Duxford footage. And just when you thought Paul Walker had retired from the hobby, look at this outrageous Memphis Bell. And that is a picture you don't see every day. He's not, not really low to the ground, is he here? What is this thing in England where they like to fly low to the ground? Great magazines, great magazines. The Spitfire, a Spitfire with uh, American markings, which of course there were many. This is George Aldrich's latest uh, GMA Allison Spitfire, a uh, Merlin or GMA Merlin. Awesome. This is interesting. Look at this picture. It says, look what happens when a fuel line cracks on a jet. <laughs> now look, speaking of speaking of things you don't think of, here's that the same jet. Looks a lot like the MIG I made years ago. Now where was that picture when I needed it? Where where, where was that picture? 
Now you have my apologies if there's still some bad spots on this tape. Carlos worked on this tape for uh, quite a while to try to clean it up with a time-based corrector and other things, but I know there's still some bad spots. My apologies, we have a brand new camera, eh, and we're trying to uh, make the most of it. I talk about an unusual paint job, something you could pick up out of a magazine. Boy, there is a nice paint job. Here's a nice thing, he actually for a trim for any stunt ship. The point is the magazines are an excellent source of inspiration, not only inspiration, just ideas of things you can model, paint jobs, ideas. I was doing a Spitfire project, I had literally hundreds of magazines and books to look at and it was one of the most enjoyable parts of the project. And in the world of aviation there's always something that you didn't see the first time you looked at it. There's always a different paint scheme or a different cockpit detailing or Zeus fittings or air scoops. There's always something. Anyway, we're coming up on the end of this tape. I got one or two lo little more pieces of mail to put on here and then we're going to be closing this out, letting everything dry and getting back to the shop tomorrow. Live to fight another day. Look at this, even late at night I get phone calls. President Nixon. Anyway, this came from Ken Clapson. We're at the end of this tape, by the way. And I just wanted to look at this real close. It's from, and like I said, Ken Clapson supplied these. I've never seen these in hobby shops up here. Maybe they're available, maybe they're not. We'll try to find out. I'll try to find an address here. Don't see an address. That, that's not good. Anyway, I'll, I hope Ken can get me the address, or maybe it's on the back, nope. But, but this is really nice. There's things on here we definitely can use, along with the Tom Lay and the Randy Smith Letra sets, which have m various other things like this. Anyway, it's from Dry Set Model Markings, but doesn't have an address. That's just funny. That, it just shows you how the world of business is. It's protected worldwide. It's protected. Why not give your address? We know, we don't need to know this. This is like the dumb thing on the beginning of videos. If you make a copy, we spank you. We don't need to know this. What we need to know is the address so we can give you a free plug. Anyway, Ken, when you get to see this, I need the address of this place. I'd like to. I'd like to number one give them a plug. I'd like to number two give them a uh, <laughs> get a couple more sheets. These look like nice things. On the next session, as soon as we get back here, we want to work on his back piece, the flip door, clean up the inside. I need to lay tape in here and make my mounts, get my mounts finalized. And I hope you'll share the tapes with all your friends. Share them with, share them with your enemies too. This is the part of the day I really enjoy. It's late at night. I look up. All my stuff's up by a heating vent drying for tomorrow. All my overnight dry epoxy's drying. All the little pin blocks are in there. And I'll tell you, at this point in time, I really feel like uh, it might even happen this year that we're going to have this model in the air flying. We've come up on some really nice weather. We have a spare fuselage, of course. <laughs> not, not intentionally, though. And we've got plenty of new tune pipes to test. We have plenty of new information. This thing is just blossoming as well as anything I could have ever expected. And I even have two fish left. Actually, there's four baby fish out in the pond. These two guys, they're mating up. They're not two guys. The white one is a female. And they've promised me they're going to supply me with baby fish all summer. Looking at Paul Walker's picture again, hey, that B-17, awesome, absolutely awesome. In fact, what I'll do at the end of this, I, th I think I still have the flight from Pasco on there. I'll close out the tape with whatever's left on this tape with that flight, and hey, hope to see you on the next tape.
obviously every everything on the field has stopped to go see the B-17. Probably the most awesome plane that's uh, <laughs> been ever been built. Really impressive, and I don't think there's a person here that has anything other than impressive to say about this. And obviously Paul Walker being uh, super, super pilot, whatever, however you want to define his skill level, will get the most out of this. understand this plane when it did crash it was quite the damage and he did an unbelievable job of uh, putting it all back together so we'll be looking forward it's one of the highlights of the next the highlights of pro stunt video we're in stunt heaven air so this obviously is going to be a real nice flight Combine this with John English's twin. I mean, there's stuff happening on this field today that's unbelievable. We'll get a better look at this on appearance judgment. We're out here working out our our team problems. Really a sight to see. If you haven't seen this, and this is uh, the, the only time you've seen it is on the video. It's probably hard to describe how impressive this is. Really cool. If there's a definition of the word cool, this is it. And it's a take-apart plane, so uh, I've heard he has to take it apart to put it in the car, so, or the van, or whatever, the trailer truck. Very, very impressive. Really neat. It even sounds cool from this far down the field, and he's got some kind of a combat or some kind of shut-off on this. Roll a motor shut-off at once, so we'll be looking forward to it. Later on in the tape, maybe getting more flights, of course, and more video, more of everything. Let's see if we can see when the motor shut off. Can you imagine this with retracts now? Oh, my God. Without, without anything, it's great. If there was one Tiger 60 in the nose, it would be an impressive plane. Just an impressive piece of work. Okay, there go the motors, it looks like. Maybe not. Maybe I'm just seeing things through the lens cap here. He's got it set so all the motors kick out at once. Look at this. Unbelievable. Really cool. circle here I got. You want the chair, Jim? No, I just want to hit it. I don't know. I'm trying to identify.